welcome to Aging Well, Changing the Conversation um, as part of the Aging Well Festival in Brighton. And I'm really pleased that we're, we're continuing this conversation. The Aging Well discussion is something I've been hosting with the University of, of Sussex uh, for the last over a year. And I have really enjoyed the challenging, optimistic, realistic, concerning. We've had every flavour of conversation during the Aging World programme. And uh, this week, um, I love the the randomness of the events. I, wrote, I was trying to write a list of all the different flavours, the, the reading, art, movement, food, drink, exercise. This is quite philosophical. You know, we've been looking at, over the festival, all different aspects, and you've got until the 3rd of October, and Molly has put a link in the chat there. So if you didn't realise this was part of a festival, you just signed in today to listen to our wonderful panel. There are lots of things going on. Some of them are online as well. Some of them are in person in the beautiful Hove. I do miss the sea. Um, I, I'm not living there at the moment. But that festival is there, and ageing well. If you missed any of the conversations that we had last last year, you can come and join us on the Possibility Club, which is where all of those webinars are. But also, um, it's a place to share ideas, thoughts, research, insights. There you go. There's the, as if by magic, the Possibility Club arrives. So you can get involved and start a conversation. So what we had with the panels last year is lots of people who were really inspired to share their own research, insights, experiences. And we had a, we've got a really great conversation going on there. So we'd like you to be a part of that. That's my call for action, which I'll remind you of at the end is this is a never ending conversation. Aging well is something we are all hoping we will get to do. Um, we are all doing it as we speak, as we sit here today. And the topic of today is really looking at um, employment, retirement. We, we, before we went live, we talked about that word. We want to change that word. And we want to discuss the findings from a, a, a small survey recently undertaken to better understand the current demand for ageing workers by local employers and the perceptions those employers have about an ageing workforce. Again, even that feels negative, doesn't it? It's a, an ageing workforce sounds like something you don't want. And as again, as we talked before we went live and we will talk in the rest of this panel, is actually it's an experienced workforce. It's people with a whole lifetime of, of credibility, uh, of a playbook of insights that we should be tapping into. So we, yeah, we'll discuss some of these the language as well. And this is imp uh, important, particularly in light of ONS data that suggests that the employment of those over 50 continues to fall post pandemic and the impact it's having on the quality of life for those people. Um, so this conversation is, is ideal for you know someone that's employed, whether you run your own business or work in an organisation that employs older people. I want to hear from you. So we have the most amazing panel, but I also want to hear from you in chat. I'd like your thoughts, your insights, your questions for the, for the panel. This is a, a webinar version, so we can't get you on screen. Um, we are recording it, so you can listen back if you need to drop off uh, if we, before we finish. But please ask questions of the panel as we go through we'll pick them up as they're talking we won't leave it till the end we hope to have a Q&A as well but if we run out of time because we, we've talked lots that makes me happy as well so we have four wonderful speakers on the panel and I wanted to start off with Claire so welcome Claire thank you for joining us this morning hi good morning my name is Claire Witt and I'm the skills project director at Sussex Chamber of Commerce um, at the Chamber, we have recently undertaken a trailblazer project for the Local Skills Improvement Plan. Now, the Local Skills Improvement Plan, it's part of the post-16 technical education um, skills bill that's recently been passed into law. And obviously, it's to look at the skills needs of the area. Um, it's being rolled out at the moment across the whole country, but we were lucky enough at Sussex Chamber to be part of one of eight trailblazers. Now, the aims of the, the local skills improvement plans, as I've said, is to kind of look at the skill system that we've got for further education and make sure that it's really being employer central. Um, is it taking into account the needs of employers? Is it working with employers on the curriculum and what help, helping the workforce that the employers need so that we've got a much more responsive skills system to help with the labour market? So the purpose really, it's about breaking down those barriers between um, employers and the skills providers across the area. Now for the Sussex um, LSIP, as we call it, 
we looked at six key sectors. Now, I won't go through them all, um, they're up on the screen, but these are the sectors that are either um, very growth in the area or high employing sectors for the area. So as part of this, this programme, we actually did an awful lot of data and research into what sorts of jobs people were going into, what sort of um, jobs are being advertised and available across the area, but also looked at kind of like the intelligence around different types of workforces and the demographics of the area. So here you can see that um, obviously Sussex, it's, it's, it's a well-known fact, it has an aging population but we were actually quite shocked that it's it's much higher than across the rest of England. Um, it's also in all local authorities across Sussex, there's a high proportion of unemployment benefits being claimed by people 50 plus, and that's really noticeable kind of across that coastal area. Again, in coastal towns, much lower proportion of working age population. And also, one thing that we really found was that, that some of the people that were hardest hit in the economy during the pandemic were older workers. So it's really obvious to us that there's, there's things around kind of like aging workforce, um, older workers, and generally, we've got a much older population and not a lot of young people across Sussex. So this proves very challenging for businesses obviously they have to think about their continued workforce now but also in the future as part of our trailblazer program we spoke with over 1350 businesses across sussex to kind of find out what their labor market needs were what their skills needs were and also kind of what challenges they 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 were facing and these are just some of the findings around kind of like aging workforce and also older people so as you can see there all sectors but particularly health and care construction engineering manufacturing really do identify with having an older workforce so that's a concern for them because obviously people are going to be thinking about what their next steps are after they retire and the businesses then are going to be left with huge skills gaps. There's also, because of the pandemic, there's a real kind of shifting culture around working. So a lot of experienced people are rethinking their priorities. Do they want to continue in their professions? Do they want more flexible roles? Do they want to go part-time? Do they have other interests in their lives? But also there's because we do have a loss of skills from older workers uh, leaving or retiring, we've got a big skills gap in um, the middle and higher management levels, which is obviously, again, causing businesses an issue. And the other thing that was very noticeable was low digital literacy among older generations, which then if they do feel that they want to work or need to work, can be a barrier for them. So the next stage in our project was we got all of this information, we were talking to the businesses, we're talking to the education providers, we're talking to a lot of people who provide careers advice and things like that. And we had to work out, okay, how do we provide solutions to all of these? So for Sussex, we've come up with the Future Skills Sussex Improvement Framework. And this basically aims to provide the solutions that, that we all need, um, but it can't be done in silo. It needs to be done with the businesses and the residents of the area at the heart, but then working with all of these types of organisations, the local authorities, the local skills groups, department for work and pensions, career support people, business support people. And what we want to do is take forward these solutions over the next three years, which is what we're now starting to work on. And just to highlight some of the things that specifically are to support older workers, 
It's around ensuring that they get the right adult careers advice for them about what they can be doing, how they can support businesses, what experiences they might be able to gain. Make sure that there's information, advice and guidance for them and online support with things like matching services for those who need to re-enter the workforce and then have better access to learning and work and better transport to be able to get to the training areas that they need. There's also um, a need because obviously there's a lot of experience out there in the older workforce and these are the people that can be supporting that talent pipeline coming through those younger people to help them gain skills. So providing um, support for education providers to work with businesses so that actually those skilled older workers can help co-create skills programs for younger people. Also collaborations with businesses on what colleges and providers call um, business advisory panels. So that's helping them decide what types of curriculum courses that they will put on. And then there's things like improving in teachers' understanding of technical skills and the world of work in general, so that they can then take that back into the classroom and those um, kind of experienced, skilled workers can support them in their understanding of the world of work as well. So that's where we're at. But I suppose because this is a really nice discussion opportunity, I will stop sharing my screen. And it would just be really nice to hear everyone's thoughts on how we can tap into those skills and those experiences of people to support the local area, to support the training of new people coming into work and that sort of thing. You touched on so many points there as well. Um, you know, the lack of confidence, the lack of digital credibility, the um, the the worry of the aging workforce about their ability to add value. There's there's so many nuances. How do you how do you provide a solution? Because this is individual almost mentoring needed. Uh, it it could be, or it could be if if as I've said with with our improvement framework, we're looking at lots of agencies getting together mm. to support all ages through the skill system. But it's not just about kind of like supporting those people that we feel, as you say, are unconfident or vulnerable, but it's also tapping into those people that have amazing skills that we're losing from the workforce. And I think that's a really important point. And if we can do that as a partnership between all of these organisations that work within the education and skills arena, mm -hmm. I think that could be a really powerful thing. There's a question from Nora, as well as providing a solution, I wonder where this is best delivered um, in workplaces, adult education. Both. <laughs> that's the point. We yeah. need to have that flexibility. Some people don't want to go into a college and that's completely acceptable. Some people want really short courses just around that little bit of skills that they need to gen up on. So it's got to be a really flexible system. And that's why we're looking at how we can make it more flexible so that it's all of those things. It can be in the community. And that's why we're saying it needs to be more accessible as well. Yeah. It feels very age and specific though, as you say, this is, you've got younger generations who feel exactly the same. And there's a nice and facilitating the ability to get those multi-generational conversations going on. They say, hey, we all feel like this sometimes and helping each other and mentoring each other. Um, Neil's got a question there. It's Claire, as a trailblazer, did you identify mechanisms to fund the various support opportunities? There are. There, there's, um, and that's again why we're working in partnership because there's no one pot of money, unfortunately. Um, the trailblazers are now being rolled out across the country and we're working with the Department for Education at the moment to do the next stages, which is really turn our framework into a smart action plan with all these partners. So that's going to be happening through until around May. Um, we've got a little bit of money for that not huge beans, I will will admit. But what that action plan will then do is within um, Department for Education, they're going to be releasing what they're calling a skills improvement fund. So that when we've got those actions, the providers and those communities can bid into that fund. 
local authorities have also got the UK Share Prosperity Fund, which again is a community orientated fund. We're looking at how um, existing skills funding like adult education budget can be used more flexibly as well. So there's lots of little pots that we'll be able to tap into. Which I think links nicely into Nicolette, your question. Um, do you, go on, Nicolette, do you want to answer it? Ask it rather. Yeah. Yeah, I'm very uh, intrigued about uh, your slide with all the organisations uh, and you already mentioned rollout in May because to get everybody on board and, and maybe to have a pilot, because I think it touches quite a lot on my work, but uh, it, it's interesting to see that if you get that started, I think it's so needed, as you said, like before we get the whole knowledge uh, cliff edge of all the people disappearing with all this, uh, the, the skills they've gained and knowledge over the years. So yeah, I'm quite interested and you partly already answered that uh, about the rollout and yeah, as you said, you have a little bit of funding, but I think this is quite a huge project. It's huge, and we'll be starting it actually in November, so that the we have to submit our report and our plans to the Secretary of State by the 31st of, of May. So there'll be lots of information on our website, and I'll, I'll put the uh, link in the, yeah. in the chat in a minute. There's already information with all of our Trailblazer reports and everything on there. We've recently done a deep dive into the digital sector as well. So all of that work's going to continue and we're just going to keep building and building um, through the winter, basically. Yeah. And do pop that so the calls to action into the Possibility Club as well, Claire, because plug into that community for the, those who aren't able to join us today, because mm -hmm. the, I think it sounds like the more we can help you. Yeah. The better. <laughs> so. Definitely. <laughs> So get it all in the Possibility Club and tell us what you need and we'll, we'll help you amplify that through, through this platform. Um, and we'll go a final question from um, from Gillian. Have you done any research on why older people are leaving jobs in your area? I think a lot of it, well, some of it does go back to, as I've said, during the pandemic and, and not just older people. Personally, I started working from home and I love it. So it, it, having those flexibilities around working and people started actually thinking about their life choices on what kind of what they want out of life, really. And I think that's some of it. But again, it's, it's the fact that across Sussex, we have an ageing population that are hitting retirement age. So it, it's lots of little factors, I think. And um, you're right. I think that yeah. working from home, wanting different things from work while still needing to work, we've all gone through that period, haven't we? Um, and a good point from, from Steph here. I agree this challenge doesn't limit to an age group. It's important to recognise everyone is fearful of tech and getting up to speed with the fast change, uh, changing pace of technology. Mentoring in businesses is vital. And again, that, that is everybody. And that's always a fear for any of us when we start a new job. What are the systems, the tools, the mechanisms that help me do my job that we you have that from day one yeah. but I, I guess there's you know and we've been through all the aging world conversations we don't want to uh you know make assumptions about a, a demographic there are some very tech savvy 80 year olds um my mum's an internet demon but there's others like my mother-in-law who's avoided it so it's again you've got you've got to work with the individuals and technology is more intuitive than it used to be that's a great thing is the user experience is a lot easier than it may, might have been when we first saw it sort of in the 90s um and a, a nice quote from from Tom who's obviously walking on the downs the economist notes an uptick of older workers returning to the workforce so he's there's are some reports of seeing a bit of a flip of have we seen that locally as well at the moment that's something we're looking into as i say kind of like we we're doing a refresh of everything that we've we've already done and that's something we know that generally again all all ages are starting to return to work or want to return to work so there's um not just with older people but that's something we're going to be looking into in our data refresh and i'm actually really interested to see what types of occupation they're going into yeah. as well are they returning to the jobs that they used to do or has that mindset changed and they are going into jobs that they feel will benefit them and their lifestyle or their community, that sort of thing. So I think that's going to be a really part, interesting part of it. Yeah. Well, there's a comment there from Gillian about a lot of the jobs in our area are pretty insecure and part time, which is put off for, for some people. Um, ah, Luke. I'm going to leave you to talk about that when you come when we, we hear from you. But yeah, it, that national data. I mean, there's so much conversation right now, isn't it, on the, the, the great, the quiet resignation and people's different ex relationships with work has changed. 
and that for every generation is going to be very interesting to watch, isn't it? Um, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to pause. Otherwise, we're going to we're not going to get the rest of our panel, Claire. I'm sorry. We've started That's off very short. Nicola, I'll come back. We'll come back to your question a bit later. But let's Natalia. Yeah, thank you so much for everybody who uh, who joined us today. And I, I'm going to quickly maybe. Uh, oh, uh, so I, let me start with firstly saying maybe it's not the most exciting. I think uh, Lucy said at the beginning of the session is like so far you've been talking about dancing, singing and uh, holidays and it's probably work is it, it's multidimensional and it's harder to talk about work because um, uh, because it, it could be understood and uh, from so many different perspectives so we can think about from the point of view employees we can think from the point of view of workers we can talk about it from the point of view of societies we can talk about it from the point of view of um, uh, what it does to our communities so from that point of view depending on what perspective we take on it of course we have to be careful not to kind of, as Lucy said also before, not to be sometimes maybe over optimistic about people's circumstances and sometimes maybe not necessarily kind of understanding the complexity of people's circumstances. But uh, having said all that, we still, uh, um, so somebody, somebody asked the question and I'm going to briefly comment uh, on this question before, before I move to, uh, to our own research. And the question was, why do people leave work in the area? And I don't think there is specific a, a data on, on East Sussex or West Sussex, but what people do list as reasons for leaving work after 55 is it's emotional demands, it's physical demands, it's work stress, and it's the workload. And the reason which is very often given for why people do stay in the research and the research studies is learning and development opportunities very often older, very often older people are not offered or not in the position to take because they think that they're just not associated with the future of organizations. Also, the reasons that are cited by researchers why people stay is if they're given autonomy, if they're given recognition, if they uh, uh, respect, and if they're also provided with mentoring opportunities. So the kind of different reasons why people leave or stay. So what's so, so work is, I started with the idea that work is multidimensional and it's difficult to think about it from just one perspective. However, there is growing research that suggests that link between all the workers' continuation and work and well-being is, is, is there is a link between uh, uh, all those worker, workers' continuation and work and well-being. We have, we have to be careful and we have to caution when we talk about this link, we don't assume any type of job, yeah? So it could, it, not any, every job is equally beneficial. And it's interesting, again, I'm going to comment on something Claire said. There has been research suggesting that if you enter a different career, uh, different from your original career. When you re-enter employment, your career is different or your role is different from your original role, that it contributes to well-being or it improves the quality of life because you see it, you see it as an extra change. And uh, simultaneously, so we know there is this link between well-being uh, and staying in work. And at the same time, simultaneously, we see, and Claire has presented us with this data, and this data is all over the place, that actually all the workers are leaving and more uh, uh, all the workers remained um, economically inactive. And uh, studies have also explored benefits for the companies to keep all the workers and those who are hiring uh, all the workers. Those research was done with recruitment professionals, and there's a whole list of different benefits that have been listed uh, were all the workers, soft abilities, organizational citizenship, which is real ability, loyalty. They, they're seen as more disciplined. They're actually also seen as more accepting of hierarchical order. They have high level of presence at work and attendance. Their willingness to work in um, unpopular hours because they often don't have child higher responsibilities. 
they're seen by uh, companies as socially able, is more polite when it comes down to interaction with customers. They're often seen as more resilient, able to put things into perspective. They are all the workers are perceived as not hopping between jobs. So they're more balanced. They describe very often as more balanced, more tempered, more interested in having a pleasant work environment. They're often seen as less competitive and they contribute to more pleasant and enjoyable work culture. And so the question that kind of we ask in inevitably ourselves is, so if we have all these benefits that's been listed in research and it's been agreed upon, we will, uh, at the same time, research also documents is that there are still negative perceptions of older workers. So there's still negative stereotypes attached to older workers. And of course, if even if we think about class talk, if you have particular perceptions about a particular group of people, certain group of people, inevitably your, uh, your view on what you can train them in and how you can train them and how you want to contribute to that training and how how much you want to spend on their skill development is very much shaped or fashioned by this perception of what they're capable of or what they're not capable of. And from that point of view, there's still so this ideas or, or misconceptions or misinterpretations or perceptions still persist about all the workers. So for example, they're often also seen as stubborn, as, uh, uh, they express skepticism towards modern ways of working. And I think that's the biggest, and if you look at the literature, the biggest kind of point in the literature is that they're perceived as skeptical about changes in organizations, about modern ways of uh, working. Being also, they're also so sometimes seen as more assertive about organizational arrangements. Uh, they, uh, uh, there is a skepticism about their physical abilities and their abilities to engage with technology. What's also interesting that uh, apparently, uh, the research suggests that the most difficult relationship of all the workers or workers over 55 have with middle management, not with senior management, but with middle management. They're also very often seen by middle management as not having raised, not having risen through the ranks, not being successful enough. And they might also describe this complacent and arrogant. So, uh, so what? So what we did? So we kind of was trying to think. So if we want to to engage or older workers, then the uh, uh, that the one of the way of doing is changing the perceptions that might or thinking of the ways how the perception of uh, organizational perception can be changed. And so the survey we conducted, the research we conducted was aiming to finding out and it, it was local research. It was, and I have to say, it's a very preliminary study, very preliminary findings. And one of the reasons I didn't necessarily put graphs um, on the slides because I didn't want people, I didn't want to mislead people into thinking that because you know when we see graphs when we see numbers it's very easy to assume that uh, uh, to assume that that's something that is tangible and you know this is these findings are very preliminary we have to work on it that's why uh, uh, it's easier to talk about it rather than kind of put it in numbers and so we set out to look at the perceptions of local empo employers and it was East Sussex and West Sussex in relation to two groups of workers and uh, and um, production workers and professional workers Mm. Okay, uh, sorry, I, I read the question. I think I'm, I shouldn't be reading questions. I am. I, I, I will. I will. I will talk about it once I finish. You're more than welcome to dive in and answer questions, Natalia. Don't worry. Uh, uh, okay. So why do I think? <laughs> How happened? I, I, I mean, I again, it's not my research directly. So anything I'm going to say, I'm going to more speculate. Uh, then I think probably middle management is younger than more senior positions and relationship between younger and older worker, uh, 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 younger management and older worker. It, it's of, of course, it's again, we have to be more specific what position the older worker is coming in. But um, uh, my experience, the only study, the only experience I had, I've looked at somebody working in banking who wanted to have a senior career in banking. They decided it doesn't want as much responsibility group of people. And they decided to uh, uh, still in, uh, uh, to enter the workforce at a lower position. And I think that we could speculate that 
middle management could be threatened by their age, middle management could be threatened by their experience, middle management might feel that their authority could potentially be undermined by somebody being, being senior in the previous life. Or it could be that they feel that, or it could be, as we just discussed, misperception thinking that they might not learn as quickly, it's harder to train them, they will create extra work for middle management versus, versus um, increased productivity, that their productivity might be lower, so they might have uh, 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 ideas about how productive all the work is. So uh, kind of in general, we can only speculate, we probably would have to be more specific uh, uh, looking at different industries, but I think age could be often a threat. You know, if somebody comes in, even if they don't necessarily act, act more arrogantly, there is this always sense that somebody knows more than you. Uh, uh, especially, you know, it, dep but it depends on the nature of the industry. So, so go going back to what we did. So th the study was set out. Mm -hmm to look at East Sussex and, uh, and West Sussex and look at, we identify 100,000 companies, acting companies, we use database for secondary data. And then we look for the emails uh, uh, and contact details of those companies. We identify 2,800 uh, 800 con uh, email addresses. So then we disseminated this uh, survey through email. And uh, one of the, also one of the concerns we do have, and that's why I'm not, we're not publicizing that uh, data uh, as much as that the response rate was not uh, as high as we would have hoped for. So we divided, all, uh, so we asked companies about uh, uh, their perception of different skills of all the workers over 50, 50 uh, um, uh, in different categories. So production workers and production and support workers and um, professional workers. And then we looked at skills with uh, we, use um, uh, Office for National Statistics to, to, and we have nine categories of skills when we ask companies to assess uh, all the workers uh, um, against. Our findings are not necessarily surprising. Uh, they are similar to findings as been in previous studies. So all, all the workers were seen. So most of our respondents, I have to say, we didn't get as many responses from private businesses. We mainly get resp uh, responses for, from public sector. Uh, uh, and it's, it was a service a work, care work, education, uh, so less so private businesses. And there, not surprisingly, um, uh, uh, all the workers were seen as more capable of um, mentoring, uh, uh, sharing their experience. So they were more likely to be hired in professional roles. There was less concern about their physical stamina and their uh, physical health in professional roles. There was more concern about their physical health and stamina in production, in production and uh, um, support roles. So companies, uh, uh, public center, uh, sector companies seems to be uh, more uh, uh, more willing to hire all the workers. The difference is not necessarily significant with private health companies and all the workers are more likely to be hired in professional roles rather than support and 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 support and um, uh, production roles. So uh, uh, this is a, a very preliminary study. We're planning to continue it. We, 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 and that's, I think, one of the reasons Nicolette asked the question about getting access to organizations. We probably need to talk to more organizations and maybe rethink of how we're going to approach organization to make it more, to make it more conclusive. But that's something we're working on at the moment. And I think that's about it. So we shall watch that space. So another call to action to pop on the Possibility Club there, Natalia, mm -hmm. is get involved and be a part mm -hmm. of the conversation. And mm -hmm. I think this leads really nicely to you, Nicolette, because changing the narrative, changing the conversation, challenging the cliches is what I kind of wrote down. Mm -hmm. um, 
uh, that was that, that so, so much lovely into you, yeah. doesn't it? So. <laughs> well, it's interesting. Maybe a, a very quick introduction. Uh, so, of course, Natalia is, is is on the research side from the University of Sussex, and I'm doing a lot of coaching with retirement and semi-retirement. And uh, in the, on the note, I do a lot of research and workshop on uh, how actually can the younger and older generation work together. So coming back like the skills and uh, yes, it's definitely true. They're leaving the workforce. But what I notice, it's also we assume a lot. We assume um, that they don't want to learn. We assume that they don't want to work anymore. We assume a lot without actually having a conversation. Mm -hmm. So for example, uh, people who leave the workforce, sometimes they want to work less hours or maybe they feel too much pressure and want to maybe um, and have, have a lesser res uh, a less responsible job, but the conversation is not even being held. So that's one thing I feel uh, not a lot of times we take into account that sometimes we just ignore the conversation. And so what is, uh, in, in my opinion, what I found also in discussions and in my trainings, transferring skills, um, we, we talked already about mentoring. So the reverse mentoring, I think is a really important one to keep each other engaged so we can learn from each other. So the younger generations from the older generation, vice versa, and think about uh, the obvious one, the digital skills, but also think about um, the uh, think about the younger generation who started, for instance, in COVID. They have no clue about organization, how it works in the office, how, how wonderful is it for all the people who have had some business cycles to actually help them, how to network uh, a life, so to speak, and how office culture works. So I think that's definitely uh, very beneficial. And another thing, I think people underestimate the differences, but also how we can uh, benefit from that. So the older generation is known for, as they say, crystallized knowledge, beautiful words. So basically that's all the experience we gather, the facts, data. So that's the, the knowledge we gained over uh, the years and experience. Whereas the younger generations have the, the fluid quick thinking, the fluid knowledge, such as problem solving, uh, data analysis, and actually to solve problems or uh, um, having issues or in project, you actually need both. And I think that's quite often uh, uh, yeah, underrated or understated that we need both types of knowledge. So that's uh, one, um, I think it was a quite important one. Um, also, um, the, the septicism, I think was already mentioned by, uh, by Claire that some people seen them, oh yeah, they're, they're sitting there for 30 years, a septical. And that's a good thing as well, seeing that done that, when you have them working with younger people, it also means that you learn from each other and also they can get stimulated again, like, oh yes, things can change. So I think that's another very important one. Uh, and yes, you have differences uh, in eras where people, I'm a Gen X, you've got a mil uh, the, how do you call them, the, the millennials, you've got the Gen Z, the techies. But after all, I think that is not really helpful to, to picture, pigeonhole people. I think it's more about having a conversation because also the communication style is different. A lot of uh, my generation uh, love sending emails, younger generation, they don't even read them, don't have time, they don't use it. So have that conversation, how can you work together? How can you best reach out uh, to make sure that uh, yeah, people communicate at the way they want to communicate and respect each other? And as I said at the start, have that conversation, what do actually all the people want? Because you see it as well, if there's a development plan, over 50s are not even included. And that says more about the company than about the aging workforce in itself. So very nutshell, um, a little bit about my, my experience, but also, yeah, what I've seen um, in reality. So any questions, quite happy to uh, answer well, them. I was going to ask you about your, obviously you've been coaching people for, for, for 25 years. And I wonder- 20, how, 20 years, Lucy. 20 years, okay, <laughs> sorry. But I wondered how those conversations have changed. I did a, um, so I did a uh, master in 2017 uh, at, in careers management, and I did a research in HR's policies and strategies to retain and retrain the aging workforce in banking and pharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. So that's how I changed my scope into the aging workforce. So it's a, yeah, okay, COVID um, hit in between. So that's the past four years. Um, it's my niche and that's what I, uh, yeah, I'm, do most so I coach a lot of people in retirement and semi-retirement and I help quite a lot of people setting up their own businesses because that, that's um, what I noticed they're actually a quite successful because they know what they want to do quite often in service industry to be fair um, mm. going into the consult because they want to work less they want to 
uh, Claire already mentioned, in, in your own hours. So I, I don't want to work eight hours a day. I might want to work four hours a day. So that they're much more in control, but they still want to be part of it. And I've seen a lot of people can't retire because of the financial reasons. And as yeah, Natalia yeah. already said, uh, we can be romantic about it, but a lot of people still need to work. We underestimate the fact that some people when they're 67 and reach retirement age don't have the finances to retire. And oh, also it, oh. demographics, sorry, um, I think we touched upon it, but Claire already said, we've got more and more people over 50 and we get less people coming into the, the, the workforce. So we need the older generation even though we're not talking about it. It's an inclusion week this week. So ageism is the next diversity and inclusion discussion, I feel. Absolutely. Um, and I, I was going to say there's a very um, unadvertised fact that older founders found more successful businesses because of that credibility. Yeah. People get very excited. I mean, university grad starting yeah. businesses, it's brilliant, but they are more likely to fail. Yeah. So with all that experience, that wealth of knowledge, the network, as you said, the experience, the business cycles, um, and yeah, this into and and seventy percent. There's been a research in the US. Don't know all the details, but women are also more successful, which I find quite interesting. One, so all the women in finding on businesses, but yeah, but that's you see, and that's uh, out of need because they can't find a, a normal job, and out of uh, the 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 wish to more freedom. So they can work in hours and days when they want to. Uh, a question from Isadora. Have, have you uh, seen an increase or decrease mm -hmm. of 50 plus people interested in going back to work or continuing to work after COVID? I've seen an increase and um, not to do. And it's just from my personal uh, experience. I have uh, had quite a lot of male candidates um, who also work is part of their life. So mm -hmm. that, um, when they actually did resign, uh, and had a nice package. They actually wanted to, even if it's voluntary or part-time, they needed the structure and the social interaction to go back to work. I always say it's 18 months uh, when you are in a relation and uh, getting married, 18 months is your honeymoon period. That's exactly the same with retirement. And there's, there is also a trend to uh, uh, unretire, I hate the words well, unretire. So people want to go back to the workforce because they miss the social interaction, uh, the purpose, it's already mentioned a few times. Um, and I think that will be more and more, um, I think that's definitely a trend we're going to see. And also, I'm afraid to say the cost of living will have an impact as well. And a question from Steph here around, have we seen any other countries offering mm -hmm. solutions? Are there anybody, is there anybody out that we can learn from? Yeah, well, I'm originally from the Netherlands. Uh, one good thing they've done there and still doing is they give everyone above 45 plus um, a career uh, coaching opportunity. So that's been uh, uh, funded by the government. So if you are self-employed or if you work for a company, public or, or private sector, you were entitled to sit back and reflect on, on, on your career. Wow. So that's, I think, a really good one. Really I think powerful. very popular and of course, it costs a lot of money, but they realized we need the aging workforce. Yeah. And we so talked before we went live about the word retire, didn't we? Yeah. And aging workforce and elderly none of these are positive all of those bring the cliches don't they but the funny thing is when you talk about cliches we do it ourselves if you think about oh i had a senior moment i'm early 50s i think senior moment what's the senior moment <laughs> uh, so we do it ourselves if, if you if you picture this if someone from 23 works with me i'm 30 years older so that person probably uh, sees me as i would see someone in their 80s and we never think about that. It's the same. It's a, the same uh, age gap. And it, uh, and you you know we talk as both you and Natalia did about people's perceptions and all those of the less flexible stuck in the ways, all these prejudices, yeah. as you say, uh, it is ageism. It is very yeah. alive and well, unfortunately, and it's how we address that. Do we do we have CVs? CVs is hard because it's going to be a massive career. Do you start yeah. editing CVs so it doesn't look like you've been working for forty years? So people then look to hire you. You take you take that off. Now you only should focus on the last ten to fifteen years anyway. But uh, I do agree that whole age age thing should should, should be left out. It's about uh, the skills. Do you do you fit uh, in 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 where's the need? And as I said, it's 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 a mixture of. Um, it's, it's a little bit, it again, was in the Netherlands. They say, like, we all have an invalid toilet access in the company because we have to, by law, but then look around how many people use it. So how inclusive are we? And that's yeah. the same with ageism. We all say they're important. 
But then if you look at the hiring, we quite often have a tendency to hire the same type of person. So the 30, 40 plus within HR. So there are some things on that note, I think we could change as well. And also, the, uh, yeah, what, what, what's old, what's aging? I think we should actually not talk about age as much as we do. It's about the skills and, and the persons. I feel a 50 year old now is completely different than, than 20 to 30 years ago. Yep. And don't forget, if I live till 80, I've got another 30 years at least, I wanna be productive. Because in the past, retired uh, after five years, people expected you to die. Now, some people have 25 years. It's also unaffordable. But that's not a discussion, I feel. No, but you're right. And we, we as we said before, we went live, let's not glamorize retirement. You know, that there is cost of living crisis. There are a lot of people who can't afford to retire, mm -hmm. but what they want to do might be different mm -hmm. to what they want to give back. And it's giving them the opportunities to, to contribute towards society, to have the income but also the structure there's lots of reasons there's lots of flavors why we want to keep working yeah. we also know it's really good for our mental and physical health yeah, to get up to get out and be doing exactly and look at japan how they incorporate the older generation because there is the uh, the, 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 the 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 example of an uh, of an aging population and they have embraced the older generation so a lot of people go there there are a lot of studies done uh germany is another country where it's um Although I think with the refugees, I think the balance is going to be different. But yeah, we, we, we need to, it's a little bit, we sometimes are very good in, in waiting to see what happens, but it's already happening. And that culture of respecting, respecting that experience, respecting that credibility, rather than, as Natalia was saying, that middle yeah. management resenting, yeah. that the dynamic is wrong, isn't it? Yeah, and, and, and um, we still have a little bit of that, 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 that that's, person sitting in the corner uh, flipping around uh, uh, a document uh, for 20 years that is not how people are nowadays and I think that's the stigma we, we still have and as I say it's also the communication style have the conversation a lot of people just feel like oh yeah but so-and-so is 60 he probably or she doesn't probably want to learn or it's all we, we we don't have the conversation I think that's definitely where we can improve yeah, it's like, oh, they're about to retire, they've clocked off, they're just passing exactly. their time. Yeah. The, ener the energy perception is wrong. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you very much. Luke, I was going to kind of lead into your point that you've made yes. here about the work you've done on so, the ages. So and, I, oh, come So Natalia. can I just uh, uh, can I just call, just make one comment about coming back after COVID to work? Mm. I think if you look at different cultural contexts, it's a huge difference depending on the health system. So, for example, in the U.S., there were few people coming back to work after COVID because most jobs don't have uh, medical insurance. And if people are concerned about get, uh, getting sick. So I think it would vary depending on what what you know, what country we're talking about. But it's definitely evidence suggesting that fewer people coming because of the health concerns if there is no health system in place to to uh, to provide for it. Sorry. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. a no, thank you. That's all good. Luke, last but not least, thank you for joining us today. And I thought, yeah, I thought I'd let you talk about the that research that you've done. Yeah, so I haven't in my actual presentation focused too much on ideas and research, but I, I'm certainly happy to talk about it. Um, I well, focus more on our Go, go for your presentation first and we, yeah. we'll, we'll bring it back. But this is it. Yeah. I mean, the best thing is, this is the whole point of these sessions. There's lots of conversations going on, isn't there? And and through through all of the Aging Well conversations, we, we wanted to highlight the opportunities to get involved and to and to learn more about it. But Luke, I shall stop talking. Over to you. We can see your slides perfectly. Great, thank you. So uh, thanks for inviting me to talk today. Uh, I'm Luke Price. I work as a senior evidence manager of Centre for Aging Better. We're a charitable foundation and what works centre that does lots of practical research to help improve society, uh, particularly for old people. I'm here today to talk to you about how employers could and should be thinking differently around issues like ageism, like flexible working and other issues we've touched on already in order to kind of enable anyone who wants to work in later life to do so. Uh, so I'm just going to quickly talk about why does this matter? Why does it matter that employers are thinking about it? Um, then I'm going to share a bit of information about what employers can do on, based on research and work we've done directly with employers, employees and recruiters and focus particularly on flexible working and reducing bias. And then I've just got a few links in my slides about where you can find out more if you're interested in doing so. So why does age-friendly employment matter? We've touched on this already. I think someone mentioned it uh, in the last session, but the older workforce is the workforce. We know that one in three workers are aged 50 plus, and there are 4 million more workers aged 50 plus 
now than there were in 2000, compared to about 1.5 million more age 25 to 49. So that is that is the labour market. That's the big pool that employers are drawing on. If they're not if they're not making the most of it, then they you know they don't stand to benefit. Uh, and by the time people are 65, under half of men and less than a third of women are still in employment. That's you know linked to pension ages and things like that. But there's a, there's a big decline as we get older. And despite seeing dispense, uh, substantial progress over the last two decades, as you can see from these graphs um, here, you know there's, a, there's an upward curve for the 25 to 49 year olds, there's an upward curve for 50 to 64 year olds, there's an upward curve for the 65 plus year olds. What we have seen is that this group particularly, and also 65 plus, is still a big gap between where we are now and where we are. There's about 13 percentage points difference between the 50 to 64 employment rate and the younger age group. So, you know, some people don't want to work and that's fine, but there's clearly some people who do want to work and this is a problem. Uh, and it's particularly uh, a problem for, you're more likely to leave employment in your 50s and 60s if you're a woman, if you're from a black, Asian or minority ethnic background, if you've got a long-term health condition, or if you're in temporary or, or recent employment. We also know the pandemic had a big effect on employment and uh, led to people being made redundant and amongst the age group 50 plus people becoming economically inactive so not engaging with the labour market at all anymore and what we know is that redundant workers aged 50 and over are half as likely to be re-employed during the pandemic so it's harder to get back into work. We've talked a little bit about this return to work, people returning to work and what's going on there. And we do know that some people over 50 are returning to work having either lost their jobs or left their jobs during the pandemic. But we also know that those who are returning or looking to return tend to be in more financially precarious circumstances. They've got higher levels of debt. So that speaks to the cost of living crisis and, and, and their ability to, to cope. And we also know those who stayed in work tended to be better supported by employers and had higher access to things like flexible working, occupational health and reasonable adjustments for health and well-being. That's all from that study that I, I mentioned in the chat. Now, part of the problem here, there's, you know, there's broad labour market things, but there's also not enough employers are motivated and acting on the opportunities of the older workforce. Half of employers do have diversity and inclusion policies targeting age. This is from some research that we did but only one in six are very likely to develop age-friendly policies in the next 12 months. The next stat always uh, makes me smile sadly, let's say, because our research also showed that 40% of employees think ageism is a problem in their industry, yet only 20% think it's a problem in their organisation. And some organisations are better, of course, but it, it always strikes me as people saying, yes, there's a problem, oh, but not, not in our organisation. And ultimately, uh, this kind of difference in employment rates for younger and older workers has a big impact on revenue there could be around 800 million pounds per year in income tax and national insurance contributions from a one percent increase in the people aged 50 to 64. also there could be a one a one percent increase in the number of people aged 50 to 64 in work could increase gross domestic products so a measure of how the economy is doing by around 5.7 billion per year and actually there's often this false narrative that well if older people are taking jobs there's no jobs for younger people that's just not true and countries with high employment rates for older workers are also more likely to have high employment rates for younger workers so what what can employers do in this context um, using the best available evidence we've set out five key steps that employers can take and the becoming an age-friendly employer guidance is available for free on our website it's based on insights for employers and employees and it's a practical summary of what you can do I don't have time in this presentation to go into all five, so I'm just going to focus on being flexible without flexible working and hiring age positively. But if you're interested, I've provided some links at the end, and you know, please do ask questions or, or go and look uh, after the session. So being flexible about flexible working. We know flexible working is important for workers of all ages, uh, but particularly for older workers, it can help them balance care and responsibilities and personal health circumstances. And it can also enable a phased transition to retirement or whatever we want to call retirement <laughs> if we've decided that that word no longer fits uh, how people's lives look. We know that flexibility makes work more sustainable. So this is from some uh, survey work that DWP did and they asked retirees age 50 plus, what would have made you, what could have encouraged you to work longer? And the three top reasons here circled are being offered part-time working, having the chance to work flexibly and taking on a less demanding role. Now, of course, flexible working is a really broad idea. It can be, as we saw in the pandemic, it can be about location. You know, many of us um, did a lot, did home working then. 
It can also be about timing, so reducing your hours, doing a four day week or a three day week instead of a five day week. But it also can be about working slightly differently, so compressing hours. I myself work a nine day fortnight, so I work 10 days worth of hours in nine days over two weeks and get uh, a Friday off every two weeks. We did a research um, with 40 workers from Guys in St Thomas's Trust and Legal in General. Uh, run by an organization called TimeWise to kind of develop and test some new flexible working elements, uh, arrangements rather. And some of the benefits that were seen through this pilot for older workers were a better work-life balance, perhaps unsurprising, less time commuting. This was pre-pandemic um, when commuting was still a, you know, a daily experience for many, many more people than it is today. It helped improve people's mental health. Uh, older workers felt they had a greater sense of value and recognition. They felt like their employers cared about them and because they wanted to be flexible and also a greater sense of focus at work. This idea, well, if you're working fewer hours or you're working differently, you won't get as much done, you won't focus as much, is just isn't, isn't true. From a line manager perspective, some of the benefits were greater productivity. So this linked to that greater sense at work. Improved employee satisfaction. They felt like the people they're managing were happier. Improved recruitment and retention, which of course is really important. Um, if you want to make sure you're, you're getting the best candidates in and keeping them and training them up. And ultimately, a more effective distribution of staff resource. Thinking differently about flexible working and working patterns enabled them to think about that. But what needs to be in place for this to work? So what we found from the pilot was that for teams, you need buy-in from managers. You need managers to believe in flexible working. You need trust across the team, everyone trusting that people are doing what they need to do and working uh you know to the same level despite being flexible you need reciprocity equity and in-team flexibility so everyone working together it's not just about your role it's about the whole team and how all different roles work together uh, and also there needs to be some capacity to provide additional support you can't just click your fingers and say right we're doing flexible work and off you go you have to think about how it works and how you need to support managers and employees to do it for organisations, uh, it's important to provide formal definitions and informal opportunities. You can't really do flexible working unless you've agreed what flexible working might look like and you're open to doing more informal things and flexing that flexible working. You need an open culture with shared values around flexibility and ultimately need to ensure structure and systems are in place. So all of these are quite high level, but we've also developed in the toolkit, don't have time to go into this now, a three stage process where you kind of where employers can think about why should we do flexible working? What does it look like already? How could we do it? What does it look like in the context of our industry, our organisation? And how might we kind of attempt it, pilot it, and then roll it out? So again, please do look on our website if you're interested in, in thinking through this more. Uh, I'm rapidly running out of time, so I'll quickly do hiring age positively. So we know that too many older applicants are frozen out of the job market due to inadequate processes, age bias, and a lack of engagement from employers and recruiters. Uh, this ultimately disadvantages employees, of course, and job seekers, but it disadvantages employers too, who will fail to draw on the experience and abilities of a significant and large talent pool. Unfortunately, now age bias in recruitment is right. Almost one in three of workers aged 50 to 70 who left work during the pandemic said they'd experienced age discrimination when looking for work. We did a lot of different pieces of research, including one looking at the experiences of job seekers specifically, and participants in our research have been told by prospective employers, you're a little too experienced, really, to be coming into the role. On this occasion, we're going to find somebody that we can train into the position. So this stereotype and idea that an older person can't be trained, can't, can't learn new things, which, of course, is wrong. Uh, we're looking for someone younger. So this is a bit more explicit because we actually feel that we fit more to the job. So directly saying you are too old. And then the one that, that I always find astonishing is someone was being interviewed by a much younger interviewer. And they looked at their work experience on their CV and they joked, 1985, I wasn't even born then. And, you know, everyone in the interview laughed along, but it made the candidate and the job seeker feel really uncomfortable and actually really affected their confidence then and in the future. Similar to the Flexible Working Toolkit, we've got another toolkit that you can access. Again, don't have time to go into it, but has five different areas that employers can think about when they want to think about this, you know, improving recruitment processes. There's a checklist under each of things you can think about, things you can do um, for each of these things. And then finally, where can you find out more? I've got a link to the website there. We've got a huge range of reports and resources looking at all of the different elements that I've been speaking about. I've also included a few more key links to our Age 25 toolkit, tackling ages of recruitment, flexible working, 
and that ageism work that I mentioned in the chat, uh, which I haven't focused on too much here, but I'd be happy to talk about in terms of how we as a society think and talk about ageing and later life and how we can actually change the way that we do that. So much brilliant information. As Gillian said, your, your website's got so much, so much more on there as well. The 1985 comments, depressing, isn't it? But, you know, yes. as Nicolette was saying, is, it, is this the finalism that we need to, you know, we, we look at sexism and, and racism and ageism is still there as being quite socially acceptable that someone could say that in a conversation? Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of things here. One, we also did a piece of research where we, we spoke to employers about ageism in the recruitment process. and a lot of employers are, or at least they say they are, very hot on the other isms, right, for various different reasons, whereas ageism is almost the forgotten characteristic, or it's the one where actually organisations say, well, we don't have a problem there at all, but they don't necessarily understand their data or really have, have thought about it. And, you know, we have people saying, well, I just look around the office and there's some older people here, so it's fine, which if you said that for any of the other forms of, you know, discrimination, you'd kind of get raised eyebrows and stuff. And then the second thing, I think, I think uh, someone else mentioned it is around this kind of internalized ageism you know this idea that because we're constantly hearing these jokes about oh I'm, you know i'm too old for this or 1985 or, or whatever we start to believe these things about ourselves and and that can limit our behavior that could be like well you read a job ad you're like well that's clearly for someone who isn't me is different to me and i can't apply for it and, and that can have a real which applies to every ism you know yes. wh whether you're looking at ethnic minorities or disabilities they'll all you know they can all look at jobs and go that isn't for me or, or women if the language around job adverts has been so addressed for all those other areas that the age has to be a part of that conversation as well and i wondered whether with all the stats we talked about over the the panel of we need you know we've got a job shortage you've got a talent shortage is that the carrot because if we try and make this a stick that you have to have a certain number of people of us over a certain age employers are going to as you said as Nora picked up as well which is hilarious you know oh yeah the industry table but not us is the carrot really re-educating around the opportunity that the these more experienced workforce members bring and maybe that case studies of organizations who are, are, are great at doing this and the impact it's had because it feels like having a go at them about it they're in denial we're not going to get anywhere <laughs> what, yeah. what do you think what, what's the solution of the the carrot angle on this maybe so it's interesting i think it differs by employer and also by sector and some in, uh, we did some research into this and some employers do want to be beaten with a stick they think <laughs> that naming and shaming would work but that's they're in the minority really and what you're talking about this kind of well, what are the benefits and actually you what need, you need people bring. here yeah, they we, are yeah you need people i mean a lot of employers i think are actually in denial a little bit they haven't really kept up to date with how uh the age you know how age profile of society is changing how the labor market's changing they just haven't realized that as i said the older workforce is the workforce and if you don't yeah. think about that um then you're going to be left behind by your competitors but also you know there's stuff around the business case and actually multi-generational teams can be really productive it's really helpful bringing experience in uh, and also not seeing older workers as, you know, that point about just because someone's older doesn't necessarily mean they can't retrain to a new role or be trained in a role. Mm -hmm. You know, we think, for example, in apprenticeships are often focused on, on younger people, right? There has been some push to change that. But maybe someone who's 55 has decided they've had enough doing whatever they've done for their career and they want to do something new. And that's fine. And we should we should base this on, you know, what their potential is and what their skills are rather than the fact that they're just just a bit older. And your slides around the flexible and flexible working, even though they were written before COVID, uh, I'm, I'm trying to, it's whether COVID conversations that we've all had in our, our own working environments are good for encouraging people to either come out of retirement, not retire, change their, their, their roles, because before COVID, employers were very reluctant and resistant because it's difficult to manage. If you give people flexibility, and all, as you mentioned, you can't just go, hey, let's just do that. Let's just all not work Fridays. Wouldn't that be fun? It, they were, and so before COVID, there was a real reluctance, whereas now it's much easier to have a conversation around, well, I actually want to do my 20 hours in two days a week or over the five or as you do, you know, the, 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 the 10 in nine. That feels like a conversation that's easier to have since we've gone through the pandemic. Yeah. As you say, it's that it's forced people like we couldn't go for, for those who could homework, which, of course, is not the whole labour market. We mustn't forget that. Yeah. Um, then 
it did force employers to think differently and they just had to do it right so that that made it but it has made them more open but equally we've seen the knee-jerk opposite reaction of employers saying when well, i want to get back to normal I, I don't like this hybrid working and it comes down to trust in many respects i think there's sometimes a lack of trust that people are working at home appropriately or presenteeism culture is is yes. very strong and yeah there's in the news every day that was this week it's been uh comment was it google who said people just don't work as hard from home i think it i personally think it's slightly overblown yeah um, this idea that people aren't and, that you, and you need a bit more trust and as long as people are delivering what you expect them to deliver then if they need to mow the lawn at lunch time you know if they need to stop to mow the lawn or whatever i was in a, a webinar the other day where someone said at the start of the pandemic they had a colleague who had done lots of homeworking and they did like a master class like how do you do it and that was one of their things you know sometimes you just need to stop and mail on or, or sometimes you just need to stop and and you know put the washing on or whatever and that's okay don't beat yourself up about that as long as you're yeah. you know still doing what you need to do then, but change the way fine. you give people tasks so this is the this is what i need you to achieve this week how you do it i remember one of my yeah. first early on in my career i worked for a pre-ipo startup and and i couldn't believe the conversation tim's like here's what i need you to achieve when you do it, i don't care what you wear to do it, i don't care i just want that done by the end of the week so but that's a different management style and again it's not going to work in every uh, organization but if you can say to people here's what i need you to achieve and if you do it at 11 o'clock at night great but as long as by the end of the week you've achieved it so but that's much more difficult to manage or the, and there is also the risk there that um so you know doing it at 11 o'clock may work for some people but you know some other people may then feel they need to be working ridiculous hours so there's this and that's why it comes back to this idea of it needs to be some you know a dialogue and something agreed and worked out and making sure that it's you know we've seen zero hour contracts they're often championed as being oh they're brilliant they're flexible but what we've actually seen with a lot of zero hour contracts is they're flexible for the employer but not necessarily no. for the employee, right? And so there's this power imbalance that actually needs careful thinking about in terms of flexible working. Mm -hmm. um, and hopefully some of the stuff in our toolkit can help employers think that through and, and make sure that it's working for everyone and it's kind of an even thing. There's a good reason to not do it though, because it's hard. So yes. that's what I mean. let's just not do that. Let's just all go back to the office. But what's, I mean, I, I'm, I don't, I'm not basing this on any evidence necessarily, but it'll be interesting to see if employers do start saying, oh, we're not doing homeworking or whatever, will workers vote with their feet, as it were, and say, well, I, I'm not going to work for you anymore. I'm going to go get a job at that organisation that does offer flexible working. And actually, research does show that in, in job ads, if you say we offer flexible working, then that, that increases the chance that all the workers will actually apply for it. Whether a statement in a job ad then leads to practice is another question entirely. But there is definitely something there about people's desire for it and also organisations saying they, they want to deliver it. You know? I'm going to go back up the um, questions here. Nicola, I really liked your comment about the sabbatical gap. Um, this idea that, yeah, we, we, we have education for all that time, don't we? Then we get chucked out and we never do it again. That this working five days a week for 40 years, they're retiring. I think it's so important to have those gaps and I know some companies like PayPal do give you sabbaticals they they, they tell you to take them because they want you to go and refresh retrain revitalize have you seen people doing that Nicolette right oh yeah um I I haven't seen it about the book I, I mentioned that 100 year life I think it's a yeah. really good one um so why not having every 10 years a gap and then you can learn new skills go traveling it doesn't need to be just like that holiday mood but um don't just sit around and, and work as a horse for 40 years and then collapse and have a retirement as my parents generation were taught to and coming back to what luke said about flexible working i noticed actually in in in, in my cohort who i coach that the uh, the older people actually miss the office more than the younger generation because they are quite often having more side hustles doing a lot of remote um so it's more in their dare say dna so i find that quite an interesting um who actually prefers to be more in office or, or is more yeah um used to be in office so i think that's something to take into account as well there's a question from neil here about is there any research about the perception of older workers and flexible working for customer facing roles where expectations may be different I can't think of anything specifically, but I do know some employers um, have, with that are very customer facing in retail, and there's, there's a couple of very kind of famous examples, have realised that if your customer base is a certain group, you know, for example, you have a lot of uh, people over 50 who are your customers, it's actually really important to have 
people that age in customer facing roles because you know there's this sense that maybe they, they you know they get me more or, or that kind of thing so a couple of employees have have started to think about doing that um there's a, there is some research i think and again it depends by sector on like the kinds of people that are expected to do different kinds of roles the hospitality industry is a very interesting one it's like who's appropriate to be in a front of office role at the reception and who's more appropriate to be working in the kitchens or doing housekeeping and there's a huge amount of gendered racialized uh, and also ageized i'm not quite sure what the word is there but um things that happen there um and so yeah it does depend hugely on the employer but there are clear benefits to to customer facing roles in thinking actually let's let's try and mirror who we're trying to to sell products to and, and or services to and you made me think of john lewis and waitrose and being q who all have em- embraced a, di- a diverse workforce but yeah i think you're right they, they've looked at the demographic of their customers and having that different relationship natalia what are your thoughts on this Yes, yes. I mean, I think it's been uh, it's been happening for a while because because there's been studies saying that even accents, so particular shops would hire people with particular accents because their customers come from either particular area or particular class, and therefore we, they're more likely to trust people who sound like them. Whether it's the good thing or a bad thing, I don't know. I also feel that I also feel that. Uh, you know, Luke was very good kind of saying that different industries would respond to different challenges differently. But also, I think the conversation when we talk about flexible work, when we talk about its conversation, it is a conversation much more about professional work. And of course, there will be elements of maybe other type of work that it's also could be flexible. But overall, if you think about supermarket workers, if you think that that type of work is much less likely to be flexible and they will be tight. So, so, and then the conversation about aging probably would be, and if our, what our survey did show that if there is an expectation in job to be physically demanding or to be mm, that, um, they will be harder for age uh, for for all the workers to argue that they're fit for the for those jobs. They still work in those jobs, and we have more people actually. If you think of the workforce, it's like aging workforce does work in care, in in waste management, in supermarkets. But in terms of perceptions, it still would be much harder for all the worker to argue that they they're fit for those jobs. And Nicolette, just looking at your comment about management's also accepting that the fact that old generation have older parents and caring responsibilities. Do you think they're more accepting of that caring responsibility than they are with people who are having young families and children? Is so go, mum's going back to work? I, I think that it's definitely, uh, again, I'm from the Netherlands, where it's very normal to work part time and having four days a week and, and employer um, paying some towards childcare. So it's completely different where I come from compared to where I'm now. Um, but I feel here, um, specifically with, with that uh, age of caring responsibilities, I think it's both ways. I think there's definitely more uh, towards, uh, because we need, again, the women as well. So I think there's definitely more development there. But also uh, the care responsibility, it's a bit like the sandwich generation. Some people still have young children because they get children in their 40s. Mm-hmm. Then they hit their 50s and having all the parents. And I think those management is experiencing themselves. There is more opportunity to be more flexible. I don't, I don't say it's like massively accepted, but because they are in the same boat, they are more accepting it. One of the things that we found from our pilot work in unflexible working and one of the principles that's in our toolkit is this idea that it should be uh, reason neutral, flexible working. It, doesn't, it shouldn't, yeah, actually really, shouldn't actually really matter whether it's to look after your kids, to look after your grandparent, or, exactly. or I mean, I don't have any care responsibilities. I like to do flexible working because it, it's a better work-life balance for me. And I like to have a Friday off every two weeks. Like It should actually matter why you're doing it as long as it fits with what the needs of the organisation are and, and that kind of stuff. Exactly. You, don't, you should not be, you should not have to justify yourself. No, I, I had it I had it refused when I asked for time to look after my disabled mother because they didn't if they let me have it they would have had to let the other the rest of the organization have it this is pre-covid but it was point blank refused with a good reason because if we did it for you we'd have to do it for all therefore we're doing yeah. it for none Actually, oh, that's I, just I something we've, we've found that caring for children is seen as a more in some employers is seen as a more legitimate 
And it, of course, there's still huge issues around that as well, but it's seen as a more legitimate than, than caring for parents um, or other relatives. You know, there's a very kind of specific view of what is appropriate care and what is not appropriate care to take time off for. It's a minefield, isn't it? <laughs> but it goes back to respect and nurturing and, you know, as you can imagine, that that damaged my relationship with that employer as it would. It damages your loyalty <coughs> because it's back to trust. All of this hinges on trust and empowerment, doesn't it? Cool. I think we're. I'm going to ask the, uh, everyone in chat if you have any final questions, please get in touch. I mean, um, it's a shame Claire had to leave us at ten because I, I think there's the it feels like the pieces are being pulled together. But if, what, all of you have, have mirrored the same perception of this is a massive opportunity it feels that employers are missing um and that we, we need to empower those who feel concerned about going back into employment and educate employers about the opportunity i'm going to go around you all for your kind of final thoughts natalia i'll start i'll start with you what are your sort of final thoughts as we we close for this panel discussion I think it's an important discussion. It's great that they we're having it. And I, it's good that work is included in this idea that improves the quality. We don't see work as just a chore, but we see work as something that we need to, to live better. And I think that's changing as, as Nicolette mentioned. And I think though there's complexities around it and there'll be people who want to do it, people who don't want to do it. And we don't want to force people to think that way. There has to be some some there has to be option. There have to be options. There have to be, you know. So, but the whole idea of including work in the conversation about quality of life, I think it's an important. And there is lots of literature at the moment, not only in relation to all the people, but the return of work. How work for a while has been seen something you do to have a lifestyle you want, you know. So work was just a way to have life independent from work. And now we're having more and more conversations that uh, work is eager, is important for the quality of life and the and the conversation and the return of work okay yeah. thanks absolutely thank you nicolette i echo all the words that uh, natalia is saying it's not just a burden but it's something we need to have purpose and that can be paid or unpaid and uh, depending on your necessities in life mm -hmm. um and what i really like unfortunately claire's not here uh we are actually also seeing actions like mm -hmm. as i said i did that research and we talk a lot about it we've got task force we've got so much and look uh, uh showed as well there's so much research out there but I think what we need is also uh, action. Okay, so how can we uh, um, bridge that gap? How can we bring the, the people who want to work, the skills that uh, we need in, in work, and how can we actually use that, 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 that workforce um, and it will benefit both parties? So, yeah, but what I've learned today, and I think it's a good giveaway, finally, we're, we're, there's more action and we will do more research um, for, with the University of Sussex. Um, yeah, and hopefully next year we will see some results. Okay. Uh, that actually people are finding uh, the work uh, and, and the employers also filling the, the gaps of the, the skills they need to have filled. Absolutely. But I did, I did respect your comment to Claire of, gosh, that's a lot, a lot of pieces she's got to coordinate there. Yeah. <laughs> but hopefully yeah, she but has that momentum, isn't it? Yeah. But that's the thing. If you don't see that little circle, I mean, she went quite quickly through. Oh, of course, do you see how many people are involved? There's a lot of stakeholders. Yeah. Stakeholders. <laughs> but before you actually are, well, let's hope uh, um, I'll connect with her. But I think it's an interesting one to see what she will get off the ground. And I think if that ball starts rolling, I think you have some good uh, examples. Then, yeah. And as I said, let, let's make sure that ageism is not the next uh, uh, diversity, but it should just be people. And the back to that that carrot stick, isn't it, Luke? As we kind of mentioned, is hopefully Claire will be successful because there are employers really struggling and employees. She's got two. She can. She's got two um, groups who need each other, and it's the more like the comms lines are slightly broken. So I think there is a, there's definitely an energy for her project. But Luke, I'll leave it for your. You can do the final thoughts as we we wrap up the panel. <laughs> What's your call to action for everybody listening today? Um, well, other than go look at some of the stuff on our, <laughs> on our yes. website, which is a bit of a... Uh, See, that's okay, we could do that. Personal one. But no, I think, yeah, really thinking through, I think what the ageism work has taught me is that we're really bad, this internalisation is really important. We're really bad at kind of not falling into the same patterns that we see all around us. So taking that opportunity to think next time, maybe one of those thoughts comes into your head. Think about where it's come from, why it is, and how maybe you can you can overcome it. It's actually a really powerful place to start. Obviously, there are bigger things in the world that affect this, but um, if we can all do that, that might be helpful. 
got to start somewhere. Brilliant. Thank you very much, panel. And thank you to Claire, who's not with us anymore. But Steph's put in their Possibility Club. So please put the links in there to, to all the, the research and the websites, continue the conversations, rewatch the webinars we did last year, which were were so much fun. They were so insightful. There's lots of great content. So let's continue this conversation. But thank you all very much for joining us. And I hope you all have a very lovely, sunny rest of the day. <laughs>